Have you ever heard anybody say or, or use the phrase that uh, um, somebody's turned a blind eye? Are you familiar with that phrase? I, I think maybe probably most of us are familiar with that, that phrase, turning a blind eye, and the fact that it, that it means to ignore, uh, to, to ignore something that you don't want to hear, what we might call undesirable information. It's like, I don't want to hear that. So we turn a blind eye. But do you know where that phrase or that idiom comes from? Okay, I didn't either until I looked it up. And as I was studying and reading this week, I came across this story. And one story explains the origin of this, of this idiom, uh, turning a blind eye. And here's the story. The British Admiral Horatio Nelson had been blinded in one of his eyes early on in his naval career. But later on, during the Battle of Copenhagen in 1801, the, the more cautious uh, admiral, his name was, was Sir Hyde Parker, he was the commander of the British forces, and he sent a signal to, um, to the fleet that they needed to retreat. Now, Nelson, being a little more aggressive and seeing that he had a, a good opportunity to, to win this battle, uh, chose to do something interesting. Now, back in the day, you may know that these admirals and ships would would uh, connect to one another. They would uh, they would talk to each other. They would communicate with one another with flags. So they had these flags and these you know various flags and and uh, now nowadays they do it with lights. They 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 had the light and they they flash that light. Um. I'm sure in the Coast Guard, you guys knew all about this. Uh, so, but back in the day, they, they had these flags, and so the, the admiral flagged, or had his guy flag to the, the fleet, you know, cease fire, we're going to retreat. And so the guy on Nelson's ship, who received the communication, turns to his admiral, and he says, you need to see this. I think they're calling us to retreat here. And the story goes that uh, the admiral, you know, picked up the, the telescope and he put it up to his blind eye and said, I don't see anything. And he put it down and he continued the battle. And... That they say that's where the phrase comes from to turn a blind eye. Now, Nelson turned a blind eye because he wanted to stay in the battle. But if you think about it, that phrase has really taken on the opposite meaning. In our day and age, we want to turn a blind eye because we don't want to get involved in whatever it is. Um, you may be familiar with a, a television program that comes on from time to time. It's, it's aired on the ABC network, and it's called uh, What Would You Do? Any of you ever, ever seen What Would You Do? And it's like... Some of you will remember Candid Camera. Now, Candid Camera was kind of funny, traditional comedy, and they would catch people with the, the hidden cameras doing, you know, interesting things. They would trick people into doing things that... But, but 
this particular show takes the same kind of concept with hidden cameras and hidden microphones and they put people in everyday situations and then try to see how will they react. In this one particular episode, there's a guy who is one of the actors. He drives up in front of a popular restaurant in, uh, in, in the New York area. And in that popular restaurant, you know, they had the outdoor seating, the outdoor dining area. And folks were all out there, you know, eating and, and, uh, and enjoying their meals. Well, the guy drives up in, in a brand new Cadillac SUV. Um, they, they show all the things that he has inside. I mean, he, he leaves his laptop, expensive laptop computer just lying right out there. He has an expensive GPS device in there. He has his expensive golf clubs in the back of the SUV. And so there's all these different things that are in there that are very expensive items. And they said there's $10,000 worth of stuff left lying out in this vehicle. And he rolls the window down about halfway and he parks. And he gets out and he pretends like his phone is dead. And so he goes inside to see if he could, you know, make his phone call. And he makes it very clear to, you know, those that are around him, yeah, oh, my phone's dead, and, you know, and, and, and walks inside. Well, folks turn him, they look at him, they see him, they acknowledge, and then go back to, to eating their meal. Well, there are three more actors. They don't all come at one time, just one at a time come. And uh, there, there are two actors and one actress. Now, and now here's one of the interesting things. When the actress who's playing the part of the, the thief, the robber, they pick this young, really nice looking, cute little blonde to be the, uh, the thief. She walks right up to the car, sticks her hand in the window, unlocks the door, opens the door, pulls out the satchel with the, with the laptop in it, drapes it over her shoulder, starts gathering all kinds of the, the GPS, walks around to the back, opens up the back of the SUV, tries to pull out this bag of golf clubs, and it's all just too much for her to handle. And so she walks over to someone who's sitting there enjoying their meal, a young guy, and says, will you help me? And gets this guy to come over and help her get the golf clubs out of the SUV, situates it on her shoulder, and then she proceeds to walk down the block and then turns into an alley you know, where they have the, the cameras and all hidden. The guy actually helps her rob the guy's car in front of everybody. Now, that didn't happen every time. A few times they have people who, who stood up and said, now, wait a minute, that's, that's not your car. What are you doing over there? But it was interesting to see how many people would sit there, look up, look back down, and just go right back to eating their meal while a car is being robbed right in front of them. I'm talking about the distance from me to the, the front pew. Ten feet, maybe. Well, here's, here's the thing. One of those guys, and, and they caught this on tape, one of the guys chuckled to his buddy he's eating with. Now, his buddy's back is facing the street. This guy's facing the street. And the guy looks up, and he chuckles at his buddy, and he says, I think I just saw a guy get robbed. And his buddy says, why didn't you say anything? And they was like, well, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe he wasn't. I, I don't know. And they go back to their mill, only to later on find out, yes, it was a staged robbery. Why do I tell you all of that this morning? Well, the, the, the truth of the matter is, it goes right to our text in Obadiah. And so, what we're going to find in our text today is that the, the people of Edom do exactly what those people at the restaurant were doing. Turning a blind 
I. So let's turn our, our attention then to Obadiah. Now to this point in our text, we simply know that the nation of Edom is doomed. We know that, that they are about to, to see the consequences of their sin come down on them. Edom is going to be destroyed. But we discover how they would be destroyed in, in the first nine verses. And if I can get Justice to start scrolling through some screens, we'll have some of that for you. You'll remember that last time we talked about the fact that they were going to be destroyed because they were poisoned by their pride. And those were the first uh, four verses there. And then we talked about the fact they were going to be destroyed because they would be pillaged of their wealth. And then, and then finally last time when we got down to verses 8 and 9, we talked about the fact they were, they were going to be destroyed in the poverty of godly wisdom. They were impoverished. They, were, they had poverty of any godly wisdom left among them. They had turned their backs on God. But what is the sin? What is it that God is bringing all this disaster on them for? How have they baked this recipe of disaster for themselves? Why are they doomed? So we pick up with verse 11. And here's God's answer. It should be on the screen for you. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You were just like them. You turned a blind eye, and it made you just as guilty as if you did it. So let's look at the nature of their guilt. What is their sin? What does the text tell us God is bringing all this disaster upon them for? What are they guilty of? The text tells us there's two, two main ingredients to their guilt. The first thing is this. They were guilty of violence. They were guilty of violence. Remember verse 10 says, for violence done to your brother Jacob shame shall cover you for violence at the end of verse 11 it says you were just like one of them who was the them well these foreigners who had entered the gates of Jerusalem had destroyed the city and had plundered and, and pilfered the people of God. So you acted just like one of them, and you're guilty of the same violence. But then in verse 11, we have this interesting word. The scripture says that, that they were found guilty of, and, and I'm using the word indifference, they were guilty of violence, and then they were guilty of indifference. The scripture puts it this way. Um, in verse 10, on that day that you stood aloof, that's the ESV version. And, and most modern translations use that term, to, to, that, that they stood aloof. That's not a, one of those words we use in, in our everyday language, and that's even the modern translation. Now, in the King James, it says it this way, that they stood on the other side. And that's the Hebrew word there is, is to stand aloof. It's to stand on the other side. In fact, if you think about the imagery here, you might be reminded of a story Jesus told one time called a parable. 
the parable of the Good Samaritan. Do you remember that one? When Jesus told the parable of the Samaritan, he talked about the fact that, that this Jew had been robbed, he had been beaten up and left on the side of the road just in, in his misery to die. And three people passed that way. A priest came by. You remember that? And he went over and, and he helped the guy, right? Okay, good, you're listening. No, he didn't. What did he do? Not only, and Scripture paints the picture. When Jesus told the story, he painted it in, in, in a lot of detail. He says that he went to the other side of the road and passed him by. A Levite, one of the ministers in the house of the Lord, who's not a priest, but, but a minister, a Levite, he also passes by down the road and sees this man on the side of the road. And what does he do? He goes and helps. No. Steps to the other side and walks around and keeps on going. It's the Samaritan, the outcast, who comes along, sees this Jew in need, and doesn't go to the other side. He comes to the aid of the man. In Obadiah, the people of Edom, these who were the kindred, the Lord says that your brother Jacob is being destroyed and you, you stand aloof. You, you stand at a, difference, at a distance and you're indifferent toward them. How could they be both violent and indifferent at the same time. Let me tell you this. Uh, violence assumes generally some act of aggression, doesn't it? And, and that what violence means, that there, there's been some act of aggression. But on the other hand, indifference suggests apathy. So how can they be both aggressive and apathetic at the same time. You know, it's like that car getting robbed. That's exactly what happened to Judah. The southern kingdom of Israel, they were attacked and they were robbed and the Edomites stood by and did nothing to come to their aid. And this is why God's wrath is, is poured out on these Edomites. The prophecy of Obadiah is God's recipe for disaster that's going to fall on them as a result of their violence and their indifference, of their aggression and their apathy all at the same time. You remember our study of the book of James, and you may remember verse... 17 in, in uh, chapter 4 verse 17 um, therefore to him who uh, knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it's a sin the new living translation uh, states it this way remember it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it You know, Jesus reminds us that there are sins that, that may not be evident outwardly, but they're inside. They, they come from the heart. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount, in, in Matthew 5, there's some scripture here on the screen for you. In chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, Jesus taught, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. That's one of the big ten, right? Ten commandments. You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Jesus goes from the outward, the act of murder, to the inward, the place where it all starts in the heart with anger. 
In fact, just a few verses down from there, in verse 27 and 28, Jesus said, You've heard it, that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Again, one of the big ten. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Even before the outward sin that everybody could see, God sees the inner sin in the heart. And that's what the, the people of Edom were guilty of. They stood idly by. They stood indifferent to what was happening to their kindred and did nothing about it. In fact, next week we're going to look at some texts that says there were some things that they were guilty of even beyond their indifference. But today I just want to key in on this. Edom had failed to do outwardly what they had failed to do outwardly was due to the sinful hatred in their hearts. The inner guilt of, of indifference to their brother Jacob later led to their outer guilt of, of violence. They might as well have been the ones burning down the walls. They might as well have been the ones pilfering the, the people of Jerusalem. Now, let's talk about application. Because it's one thing to look at, at Scripture and say, you know, well, that was then. We, I'm just giving you a, a historical narrative. No, there's, there's application to our lives in this. So let's talk about application. I want to share with you some disturbing facts about the contemporary church in America. Now, when I use contemporary, I'm not talking about the ones that, that sing all the popular songs. Sometimes we talk, call that contemporary worship songs. But when I say contemporary church, I just mean the church now, today, wherever you go, the, the church in America. Dr. Bill uh, Hennard is a professor at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, I'm reading one of his books for a doctoral seminar that, that I'll be in New Orleans to, uh, to take part in this week. And as I'm reading this book on church revitalization, there are some startling facts that he brings up. The church is called, or I'm sorry, the book is called Can These Bones Live? A Practical Guide to Church Revitalization. And here's the statistics. Only 15% of the church in the United States are growing. Only 15% of all churches that name the name of Jesus Christ are actually growing and just 2.2% by conversion growth. Do you know what conversion growth is? Conversion growth is when the church goes out, the people of the church go out, win somebody to Christ, bring them in, baptize them. That's conversion growth. Churches often grow because some church down the road disbanded, and now those believers need somewhere else to go, so they come over to your church, and you bring them into the membership, and now your church has grown by membership, by number, but not by conversion, because they were already believers. So only 2.2% of churches in America are growing by conversion growth. 10,000 churches in America have disappeared, ceased to exist in a five-year period. 10,000 churches gone. On average, 1,400 pastors in America leave the ministry not every year, every month. Only one in three, one-third of churches, church attendees, believe that they have a responsibility to share their faith. Half of all churches in America did not add or uh, add any new members between 2010 and 2012. Half of all churches in America, zero growth of any kind. 
They didn't add any new member. Churchgoers are getting older. Especially when compared to the general population. What that means is the, the, the mean or the average age of the population in America is much younger than the population in the church. Those that are, that are faithful to attend the church. And I mentioned this last week about millennials. Those that were born between uh, uh, 1990 and, or, or 1980 and 2000. Uh, millennials are on the most part, unassociated whatsoever with the local church. Now, what do these statistics say about the church? And this goes to your, to your outline. I, I want you to get this down this morning. It says that we, because we are the church, we are apathetic and indifferent to what the enemy is doing all around us. We, no sense of pointing fingers anywhere else, but we, us, we are apathetic and indifferent to what the enemy, now, who plundered Israel? Who plundered Jerusalem? Some enemy of some kind, while Edom stood by and watched. The application is clear. We're Edom. We're sitting by and watching the enemy attack the world around us, and we're apathetic and we're indifferent to it. Jesus called the devil what? The thief who came to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. And while he is pillaging and destroying lives. And the lost are bound for an eternal hell. We sit idly by. Folks, I, I refuse. I refuse to waste another minute. I refuse to sit by for, for one more moment in apathy and indifference. God knows and judges aloofness. Indifference. Of his own church. It, just go and, and read Revelation 2 and 3 about the seven churches and see if, if Jesus doesn't have some words of of condemnation their pride had poisoned them their wealth had withered and godly wisdom was gone in Edom and in much of the church in America today why is our wealth withered I think it's tied right here. Aloofness, apathy, indifference. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. And we have to ask ourselves, well, what is our prognosis? If that was God's judgment for them, well, what does he, what does he do now? 10,000 churches in America have disappeared in five years. Why? Because they were apathetic and they were indifferent to the lost around them. They did not reach anybody for Christ. They became, they became self-centered, self-focused, rather than outward-focused. They became indifferent to the world because it was all about me and us and ours. Us for and no more, and now they are no more. They're gone. And let me tell you the truth. Eastwood Baptist Church isn't far behind. It's just the absolute truth. Unless we do something about that. 
A couple more points I want to make before I wrap it up. What is our prognosis? Question is, are you willing to die to hold on to the way we've always done it? Are you willing to die to hold on to the way we've always done it? Are you okay with dying? A slow and painful death of, ag of apathy. Are you okay with that? I'm not. I'm not okay with that. God considers it a sin of violence. Because sitting by and watching the lost dying in their sin makes us just as guilty as if we're walking them to the gates of hell and throwing them in. I know that's pretty pointed. But that's just the way it is. There's no other way to, to make that application. Tonight, tonight at 5 o'clock when we meet for our evening worship, we're going to do some witness training 101. Okay? Witness training 101. If you're sick of the apathy, I invite you to join us. If you're sick of, of the apathy, then you can do something about it. The answer is revival. The answer is revival because until we allow God to do a work in us, it's not ever going out there. And until we finally get to the point and lose our pride and say, God, I'm guilty. Jesus, I am guilty. You think I could come and preach this before you and, and not have to have gotten down here on my knees before God this week? Absolutely. I had to get on my face before the Lord this week and say, God, I... It's easy to go through the motions. It's easy to, to plan and prepare for, for worship and services and, and activities and programs that we do in the church and just go through the motions and jump through the hoops and, 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 and convince ourselves, well, we're making a difference because we're teaching children the, the, the ways of the Lord and, and they're going to grow up. And, and God's saying, yeah, that's a good thing, but what else are you doing right now to go tell the world that Jesus is alive? And he's the only answer for their sin problem. What are you doing? And so, like me, you get on your face before God and you say, God, I'm, I'm guilty. I don't want my pride to poison me anymore. And I want the wealth of my witness to quit being sucked out of my life. And I want godly wisdom back. At the end of our preaching time, we have invitation time. And that's where we are. I'm done preaching. But after the preaching comes the response. It always has. Always. You go to Scripture and you find me a place in Scripture where somebody didn't preach and there wasn't a call for response. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people came. I need that Jesus you're talking about, Peter. When Nehemiah stood before the people. He says, what are you people doing? I left you for a while. I came back and, it, you know, you're, you're not doing what, what you're supposed to be doing to worship the Lord and serve Him. And the nation stood up and said, we're guilty. And they responded in repentance. I'm trying to manipulate you into anything. I'm not trying to guilt you into anything, but I'm only asking you to respond. 
to the absolute truth of God's word. And unless and until we do that in a public way before a holy God, we're just sitting idly by watching the world. So today the invitation is, is this. If God's speaking to you about any of this, it's time to get on our face before him. If you need to personally talk to me about a decision, I'll be here. And, and let me know that you, know, you need to talk to me. You need to give your life to Jesus. That's pretty important. Most important thing you'll ever do. You may need to join this body of believers. That's, that's a decision, a public decision. But if nothing else, don't we need to just fall on our face before a holy God and say, God, we're, we're done with pride. We're done with apathy. We're done with indifference. And this church that I'm a member of is not going to be one of the 10,000 on my watch. Not going to happen on my watch. If that's your decision today, I invite you to come. Make that a, a public profession, a declaration before God that you're all in. And we're going to do whatever it takes to not be one of those statistics. This church is going to grow because we're going to tell people about Jesus and compel them to come in.